Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Submarine History. Today in briefing number 52, uh, we're going to talk about torpedo propulsion systems. This is a two-part briefing. Today we'll talk about the earliest forms of torpedo propulsion systems, up through compressed air. Then in part two, we'll talk about dry and wet heater systems, as well as electric. Read the description to this briefing. It has relevant related references and links. I have a Discord as well, and there's an invitation link on the channel banner. If you like the briefing, you can leave a super thanks or consider a channel membership. Your donation helps offset the cost of purchasing books, professional memberships, and software needed to write and record the briefings you've come to enjoy and appreciate. Finally, a uh, thank you to the United States Naval Institute for all they do preserving and promoting world naval history. If you have any questions about the briefing, leave them in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, let's quickly review here in part one, primitive torpedo propulsion systems, the earliest methods for making torpedoes go. Going all the way back to the 14th century, the earliest form of torpedo was the floating sea mine, and its propulsion system was a current or tide, the wind, or a combination of these. And we're still doing this in the 18th century. Just drop your torpedo in the water and watch it slowly float towards, hopefully, an intended target ship. There are a number of problems with this method like there are issues with guidance, which we're not going to talk about today, uh, and the torpedo being spotted as it floated to the target ship, giving that ship time to either destroy the torpedo with gunfire or just move out of the way. In the early 1800s, humans become the motive power for the torpedo. Now, in the case of Robert Fulton, he had humans rowing low-profile catamarans at night, which had the speed and stealth to quickly approach an anchored target ship, dropping pairs of torpedoes joined together across the bow of a target ship. Those paired torpedoes would then catch on the ship's anchor chain and be pushed up against the hull where they would explode after a time delay. During the Civil War, we're still using human power to deliver a torpedo to its target, but now the torpedo is underwater and we're harder to see because we're using an actual submersible for a stealth approach. The next chapter in torpedo propulsion involves compressed air. Just two years after the Confederates delivered a fatal spar torpedo to the USS Housatonic by the human-powered H.L. Hunley, Robert Whitehead developed a prototype torpedo in 1866. He devised a propulsion system that consisted of an air flask connected to a two-cylinder air engine, which in turn was connected to a drive shaft and single propeller. The prototype had an air flask that held compressed air at 370 psi. Air was released from the flask through a regulator which allowed the air to be fed to a two-cylinder air engine at a constant flow and pressure. The cylinders were 90 degrees apart, so, so you can think of it as a V-twin motor. This arrangement propelled the torpedo at 6.5 knots for the first 200 yards, then at a lower speed out to 300. The single propeller could cause torque-induced roll, but stabilizers and the low speed minimized the issue. By 1875, contra-rotating propellers were being fitted to Whitehead and Royal Navy torpedoes because of the increased torpedo speeds inducing more roll. There is a YouTube channel uh, run by a gentleman named Rob uh, Brassington. On his channel called uh, VBBSMYT, he makes 3D animated videos that demonstrate how military weapons work. And he's done six videos on torpedoes, including uh, one on the Whitehead-designed Royal Laboratory's 16-inch torpedo from 1876. That torpedo is similar to Whitehead's 1866 prototype, and the video demonstrates in detail how the air engine works. And I have a link to that video in the description to this briefing. Now, a consequence of using air for propulsion is that, as air is exhausted from the torpedo, a noticeable bubble trail is created because nitrogen is insoluble in water and oxygen is only slightly soluble. This bubble trail, during the day, uh, not only would it alert ship lookouts that a torpedo was coming for them, generally it gave away the bearing of the sub that launched it. You could minimize this by using the torpedo at night, but if the weather was calm, the moon was out, or there was bioluminescence in the sea, lookouts could still possibly spot a torpedo bubble trail. By 1898, Whitehead's torpedoes are using air flasks under much higher pressure, 1350 psi for the 5 meter long, Whitehead Mark I torpedo being manufactured by the U.S. under license. The Mark I uh, Whitehead also had contra rotating screws to eliminate torpedo roll. It had a gyroscope as well, uh, which was introduced around 1895. On this slide, uh, I have the propulsion system highlighted. Starting from the bow of uh, the torpedo, we have uh, the air flask, that's B, a three-cylinder air engine, C, a drive shaft, that's E, and the contra-rotating screws, that's you. 
and air is exhausted out of the stern of the torpedo. Let's take a closer look at the air engine for this whitehead. It's a three-cylinder, single-acting piston engine made of bronze to resist corrosion. The cylinders are 120 degrees apart. This particular uh, radial engine was developed in 1875 by Peter Brotherhood and was simply referred to as the Brotherhood engine. Piston air engines were used uh, in torpedoes by most of the world's navies through the end of World War II. The exception was the U.S., which turned to steam-powered turbines around 1904. What's meant by single acting? In the case of a single acting cylinder, that's pictured on the left, air enters the cylinder and pushes the piston down, okay, that's the downstroke, until a vent port is exposed and the air is exhausted out of the cylinder. Now in this picture, it's shown that a spring is compressed by the piston downstroke. That spring pushes the piston back into its original position when the vent port is exposed. That's the upstroke. We don't do that with the whitehead engine. Instead, we use multiple pistons to push each other into position. The picture on the right shows a double acting cylinder. With this type of cylinder, uh, we use air to push the piston up and down directly. Coming back to our Brotherhood engine, Air enters the engine crankcase through annular channel R, and then it's carried to the cylinder via air passage S, and, in, and then into the cylinder via port B. As the piston is compressed, an exhaust port is exposed, and the air is exhausted out through the hollow drive shaft. In terms of performance, you're just limited by the volume of air carried on board and the amount of pressure available. By the early 1900s, uh, air-powered torpedoes were achieving speeds around 30 to 40 knots and traveling distances between 600 and 4,000 yards. During that time period, torpedoes made for submarines were smaller than those used on surface ships. Smaller torpedo means less air, so those torpedoes would be on the lower end of the performance envelope. By the way, the compressed air carried on board does more than just drive the screws, okay? That air powers the gyroscope, course, and depth control systems. Starting around 1903, navies began to implement dry and wet heater propulsion systems for torpedoes. And again, I'll talk about those systems as well as electric propulsion systems in part two of this briefing. As I indicated a couple slides ago, uh, the piston-driven air engine was the standard torpedo propulsion system for the majority of the world's navies until the end of World War II. However, there were alternate torpedo propulsion systems being developed and implemented around the same time as the Whitehead. These alternate propulsion systems fell under one of two categories, potential or kinetic energy systems. And we'll look at a notable example from each category in the next couple slides. The Brennan Torpedo. This torpedo was first developed by Irish-born Australian inventor Lewis Brennan in 1877. It was powered by two contra-rotating propellers that were spun by rapidly pulling out wires from drums wound inside the torpedo. So think of it as a spinning top. We wind a string around that top, yank it, and then watch that top take off. And that's the basic principle with the uh, Brennan torpedo. I've put a red box around a cutaway section uh, of this Brennan, which shows the two drums in series. These drums are mated to their own drive shafts, uh, and wires wound around the drums in opposite directions, so that when the wires were pulled out through the stern of the torpedo, the props spin in opposite directions. How exactly did the system work? Uh, I'm going to do my best to describe it here on this slide, but I have a link in the description to this briefing to um, the VBBSMYT YouTube channel, and uh, they do they do a, a 3D animated video on this Brennan and its launching system, and it's really, really good, so you need to watch that. Anyways, uh, you're probably realizing this was not a torpedo system used on uh, ships or subs, uh, and it wasn't. These torpedoes were meant to be launched from land, and they were used for harbor defense. You'd have a high point overlooking your harbor, and on that high point, you'd build a slipway with a track or a slide. The Brennan would be laid on that track and secured in place. The torpedo is heavy, and it's high above the water, so we have a certain amount of potential energy stored up in that system. When you wanted to launch the torpedo, you'd pull a pin that was holding the torpedo in place, and it would start to slide down the track and accelerate. At the same time, as the torpedo is accelerating down the track, you'd have a steam engine, which is off the picture to the right, connected to the torpedo through its wires. That would start reeling in those wires to spin up the props. And this system could power the torpedo uh, up to around 20 knots for about 1,600 yards. This torpedo system was used uh, around the UK and its colonies for harbor defense from around 1890 to 1906. 
These two pictures are from Cliff Fort in the UK, uh, which is at the entrance to the Thames River. In the left picture at the bottom uh, are portions of the track and slipway that the torpedo would have rested on. And in the picture on the right, uh, it's a different angle that shows more clearly that slipway and, uh, and the remains of the track. With the Brennan torpedo, uh, we have this potential energy stored in the system that, when launched, converts to kinetic energy as it travels down the track and hits the water. With the kinetic energy system, we have all that energy we need immediately as the torpedo launches, and that's what we're going to look at next. The Howell torpedo. Unlike the Brennan torpedo, we did take a look at the Howell torpedo previously in briefing number 49. Now for propulsion, the system employed a flywheel that was spun up to 10,000 RPM right before launching. Those revs were used to power two props that were arranged uh, in parallel, side by side, uh, on independent drive shafts. And here we have a view of the props and rudders. For launching, uh, the Howell would be topside on a ship uh, in a launching tube. A steam-powered spindle was then connected to the torpedo, and that spun up the flywheel. The spindle was then disconnected, and the torpedo shot. The flywheel had enough energy to propel the torp at up to 25 knots over 200 yards and then slower out to 800 yards. Incorporated into the design were variable pitch props to automatically maintain speed during the run as the flywheel spun down. There was initially a lot of promise with this torpedo. It was much simpler to design and build uh, than a Whitehead Mark I, and it was much smaller with an equivalent warhead to some of the Whiteheads that the U.S. was uh, manufacturing under license. It also didn't leave a bubble trail because it didn't use air. But there were production problems, uh, and that gave time to improve the design of the Whitehead to the point they exceeded the performance of the Howell. The need for a steam engine to spin up the flywheel uh, also made the Howell unsuitable for submarines or for ship-launched torpedoes below the waterline. Like with the Brennan, uh, the SBBSMYT channel has a great 3D animated video of this torpedo as well. Uh, and like I said before, I've got links to all those videos uh, so you can deep dive this stuff. Okay, uh, last slide in here. I'm just going to try to summarize the characteristics of uh, the torpedoes we've talked about today and a few others so we can compare and contrast. On this table, I have listed uh, the four torpedoes we've talked about today. Uh, those are highlighted in yellow. And then I've added in selected torpedoes from other countries from around the same time period that use compressed air alone. Uh, feel free to stop the briefing and study the slide if you wish. The takeaway from the table is that uh, you have a certain design envelope with regards to compressed air. All these compressed air torpedoes are between 14 and 18 inches in diameter and about 5 meters long with comparable overall and uh, warhead weights. This design envelope gets you out to about 1100 yards at speeds between 24 and 27 knots. The British Mark V, uh, compressed air is under a little more pressure so we can get a higher speed. Uh, the 800 yards at 30.6 knots, uh, it seems short. Um, that's what was listed in Branfield Cook's book, uh, Torpedo. Um, you would likely to be able to run that torpedo at a slower speed and extend the uh, run distance. The Japanese uh, Ho-Type 38 number 2A uh, is also interesting. Its dimensions are pretty close to that Mark V, uh, but it shows a range of 3,300 yards at 20 knots, uh, which is way better than any of the other torpedoes listed. I tried to find out the air flask uh, pressure, uh, but I, I couldn't find anything. Uh, but I have to believe, uh, though it's at least 2200 PSI like the Mark V, and it would have been interesting to see what the range would be uh, at 30 knots. If you had enough data, uh, you could probably plot a generic graph of speed versus distance uh, at various regulated pressures, and maybe that's something for down the road. Okay, uh, we're finally at the end of part one of this briefing on torpedo propulsion systems. As I said, in part two, we'll talk about dry versus wet heater systems and, of course, electric propulsion. And then that'll carry us through World War II. I hope you enjoyed this briefing. Leave your questions and comments below. Come out to the Submarine History Discord and say hi. Till next time, peace out.